Great job. One, three, and five. And he'll tell you. I will. How are you, Miss Debbie? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. Thank you again for coming and visiting with me. Oh, sure. We appreciate that. My so, pleasure. Here we go. It's nice. Take 30 seconds and just breathe. Between the Brussels sprout planting and locating the communion wine, grape juice, uh, it's been quite a, am I on? You never can tell. Am I on? Good. We want to welcome everyone to Palmetto Presbyterian this morning. We're celebrating communion, obviously. And greetings to all of you in the world of Zoom. We want you to know that we're praying and worshiping with you and for you and alongside you this morning. Some announcements. We're meeting as a session on Tuesday afternoon at 5.30, September 6th. Up for discussion are the process of the pulpit nominating committee and for choosing a new pastor. The staff had a good meeting last week and we talked about a number of things about the thrift store. Uh, we've got a new flag and we are going to advertise more vigorously in the North Country News. We also talked about the opening of the garden and how we might work on the mission statement. The garden is open for planting. How many plants did you see in there this morning, Patty? Two? Our two? So, and I know the kids have got one of their plants in there. So, uh, welcome to planting. You see that we're celebrating communion this morning and the session voted to do this on the first Monday, first Sunday of each month. Are there other announcements that I am forgetting? Ah, uh, thank you. We have a congregational meeting, very brief, but important next Sunday. And last but not least, we have a birthday this week for Dorothy Smallman. So happy birthday yesterday. Do we sing to Dorothy? <laughs> Right. Glad you're with us. As forgiven people, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Please greet each other. Uh, you know, we've got some friends here this Sunday, uh, one of whom, the ancestor of one of whom contributed to the last hymn we'll sing this morning, allegedly. Ah, uh, you missed it, David, Robin. 
Yes, we'll let you tell the story before the, the singing of the final hymn. Have you greeted each other sufficiently? No. Hello, Karen. Good morning. Good morning to you. Morning to you. Peace be with you, brother. I heard great reports about your preacher last week. And uh, I mean, she's so perfect. She's even humble about that. Did you want to rebut? Okay. It's a good crowd, isn't it? <laughs> We're going to worship God now, uh, first with our prelude. We make our prayer of confession in the full assurance that God forgives us and thus we have life. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we come this morning acknowledging our sinfulness and the sinfulness of our world. We confess that we have not loved you as we ought, nor have we loved our neighbors. We have grown lax. Increase our enthusiasm, forgive our sin, make us zealous in your service. Let us continue. The Lord does not forgive us because of our merit. Instead, God is love. We are forgiven out of God's great love. 
Our hymn of celebration this morning is number 413, Break Thou the Bread of Life. We're singing verses 1, 3, and 5. 1, 3, and 5. We affirm our identity in Christ by using a portion of the prayer of St. Francis. Let us pray together. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is error, truth. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying to ourselves that we are born to eternal life. Amen. We love to go out to eat. You ask me about any restaurant in Sarasota or Bradenton, or even Palmetto, and I can come up with an answer. One of the questions I like to ask people uh, is, what's your favorite restaurant around here? I get some great answers that way. One of my books described me as an eater extraordinaire. I loved that. Oh, and uh, it fit me. Anyway, I'm excited today to have a text about eating and hospitality. Who do you eat with? This text is about that. A simple question, who do you eat with? Sally McFaig, one of my, our most prominent theologians, has a story about eating. She recounts how when we get to heaven, there will be a giant communal Lord's Supper. As we sit down, we see that many of the people around us are people that we hated, our enemies even. Surely God made a mistake 
We weren't supposed to be seated with these idiots, these moral reprobates, those greedy, corrupt bankers, or nasty criminals. Maybe, just to extend this parable, we asked the maitre d' whether there's been a mistake here. And she says, no, that's, that's what is in God's design. God's status system is inclusive of those we think beneath us in this life. Let's read the passage. From the Word of God, the Gospel of Luke 14, the first verse and verses 7 through 14. This is the Word of God. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case somebody more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, Jesus says, go and sit down at the lowest place. And then your host, when he comes, may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also, to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the word of God. Amen. Amen. It's significant to this text to understand that Jesus is eating with the Pharisees. Now, that could be interpreted as a key to the great reversal that happens here. Eating with the Pharisees might have been seen by some as a high-status occasion. So the context of the parable makes it even more uh, striking. Some of the Pharisees could have heard the parable as insulting, if not condemnatory, of them. You suspect, and it's true, that in the first century as now, just as you eat, who you eat with confers status or detracts from your status. So the rich ate with the rich, the poor with the poor. That was the accepted norm in the social matrix of the time. At the Sabbath meal, you get this idea of Jesus. It said, the Bible says he observed what happened to the people as they came in. And some made their way to the head table and the host had to come and say, I'm sorry, but you don't really belong there. You've got to go down the table. And then others who come in and sit at the bottom of the table, the host comes and says, come sit up higher here. Jesus advises those who come to sit in places where they will not be asked to move down, but to move up. And then Luke says, all who exalt themselves will be humbled and all who humble themselves will be exalted. 
Okay, so there, there's a, a, there are a lot of angles to this parable. It's got immense power, and we can only profit, profitably look at one of them. And I would suggest we look at the humility and humiliation evident here. Well, we could, we could discuss this parable as only good advice to banquet goers. But, but there is a shift there at verse 10. The setting changes from being one of a normal celebratory banquet for those being honored to one where the least celebrated are honored. The important thing I think Luke wants us to see is that this passage completely overturns the norms, the social norms of the society. And he does it at the house of a Pharisee. Indeed, the Pharisees are known for being proud of their righteousness. But the honorees are anything but those who are usually honored. Jesus' advice overturns the normal patterns. He's counseling humility in the place of those who prided themselves on their righteousness. So at least two social customs are shattered in this passage. First, the web of relations that's nourished included many who don't enjoy the same status as each other. Second, the invitation to the banquet was given not to those rich enough to reciprocate, but to the crippled, the lame, the tax collectors, other bottom dwellers. So here's a reversal of social and economic power anticipated not with long faces, but with feasting and joy. This is what the kingdom of heaven is about. Things in the kingdom are different from what they are here. The future kingdom is about service, humility, the gracious inclusion of those who are usually excluded. It's also about everyone being seen as equal. I don't believe that the illustration of the one who overstepped his bounds was directed particularly at the Pharisees, though they may have taken it that way. But it does illustrate the uh, mistaken values upon which many hierarchies are built and also the humiliation that awaits the proud. Have you ever been to a bank, a wedding, and because the bride and groom are people you know or are related to, you assume you'll be at the head table. You go up there and you look at the little place cards, you know, surely this is a mistake. They forgot me here. And you realize that your place card is back there about halfway among the tables and you worry that people may have seen your face getting red. Jesus commends humility, specifically the humility of great ones who don't think very highly of themselves. The point of this reversal is not to establish a different hierarchy saying that the poor are better than the proud or rich, but rather to crush our tendencies to think of others as better or worse than ourselves. We're not supposed to deal with those categories or think in those categories at all. Often, and you know this, some are regarded as more important simply because they've got more money, whereas others are considered or discounted because they don't have much money. Well, you know what that family's like.
people may say. The poor can, use, can often be simply ignored. But Jesus says that the lowly are recognized as cherished recipients of God's favor and help. And Luke encourages us to resist any thought process that diminishes the humanity of others. God's kingdom is built on the recognition that we are all beloved children of God, no matter our wealth or status or power or whatever. To make the point, Jesus says that when we give a dinner party, we should invite only those who cannot reciprocate. So not just our friends, neighbors, and relatives, but the poor, the lame, the blind, foreigners, newcomers. God calls us to invite those people, not because they can invite or repay us, but precisely because they cannot. Jesus is not an Amy Vanderbilt here giving us etiquette rules. The Greco-Roman world is built on patronage. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You help me get a contract, I'll buy my building uh, materials from you. You donate to my college, I'll let your, I'll see to it that your children will be accepted there. Jesus is castigating that system of patronage because it's the way that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. In contrast, Jesus invites us to envision and embody a society where we're all equal, where humility is a virtue, and where respecting each other is routine. In this new kingdom, all are respected. All are raised up and restored to God's banquet table. We pray that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Speaking of heaven, one of my favorite films is Places in the Heart, starring Sally Field and John Malkovich. The setting is the delta of the Mississippi where cotton is king. And this is about uh, 60 or 70 years ago. In it, Sally's husband is a, a sheriff who just happens to get gunned down in a stupid uh, gunfire. Sally is left alone to run their cotton farm and to make the loan. Well, the bankers flock in and they want to take over her farm quite clearly. But Sally says, no, I'm gonna to try to make this loan. She hires a black man. So this is, this is Mississippi in the 30s or 40s. Mose to help her manage the place. In exchange for some relief on her loan, she takes in John Malkovich, who is the blind relative of one of the bankers who wants him out of his sight. Together, they start working the land. The Ku Klux Klan has other ideas. They threaten to capture and torture Mose. They try to scare John Malkovich off the land too, but this little community around Sally rallies. They manage to raise, pick, make, and even exceed their cotton quota and loan, loan payment. Tragically, Mose must leave town out of a threat that he's being lynched, but he leaves knowing that he can manage a farm. There's a lot more to the story. I'm sure it's on Netflix. The film ends with a scene at the local church 
where everyone is celebrating the Lord's Supper. Gathered there, and you see them sitting on a row, are Sally and John Malkovich, the disabled blind relative, and Sally's dead husband. And you think, well, he was dead. But then you realize we're no longer in Mississippi. We are in heaven. And we see seated next to Sally's husband is the man who shot him. These are people who've been raised from the dead. And then there's Mose and the bankers and several others from the Ku Klux Klan. They're all gathered together at the Lord's Supper. They're all equal. And they're singing and sharing in the Lord's Supper together. Just like us. Let us pray. Almighty God, strengthen us by this meal. Help us to be strong in your service. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. At this time in the service, we recognize our response to God's goodness by taking up a morning offering. God, take our lives, take our offerings, help us to be good servants of you. For we pray in Christ's name, amen. Okay, comes the time for prayer requests. I know you've got all sorts of other concerns that you bring yourself, but we wanted to gather concerns. Uh, glad to have you back with us, Karen. And, oh, you're worried that I won't un be understood. Mo Garrity? Yeah, Garrity, he's from our building. Yeah. Okay, very good. Looking for a knee replacement. I can I identify with it, that. Trying to get, get better again. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Karen? I would like to have a prayer for my husband, Bill. He is going through some blood pressure problems, and he's very tired. 
So that's Bill Fawcett, and I've forgotten Mr. Garrity's first name, Bob. MOE. MOE. Very good. Thank you. Other concerns? Patty. <coughs> Thank you. Brian. Praise the Lord. Others. Yes, Debbie. I'd like everyone to keep in prayer the Suncoast Emmaus weekend for the men is coming up this coming weekend and then the women the following. It is a time where people get together, teams who have prepared to help people we call pilgrims form a closer walk with Jesus. It's a very inspiring weekend and it's entirely <laughs> prayer ba based for it. And uh, the power of prayer is wonderful. We've been recipients of it recently with my daughter, as Brian said, but the weekend is very important. So if you can keep those groups yes. lifted, I appreciate it. Others? Yes, Kathy. Amy, Amy Dore, and Psalm. Psalm, is that the way you As say it? Psalm. Okay, you. very good. Mary? Our son, our grandson, Vince Molinero, is going to be headed for boot camp with the Army on Tuesday. So pray for Vince, please. Okay. Let us pray. Nourishing God, healing God, steadfast God. We worship you, we adore you, we turn to you for wisdom and guidance. Send us your spirit always. Make us alert to your presence throughout our daily lives. We confess that like the Israelites, we often complain and look to other places to fill our void. And when we find those other places do not, we turn to you again. Let us look to you. This morning we bring very specific joys and concerns that Karen Yuga is back with us for Tamara's escaping from death and being better. We remember others who are facing illness. Pam Sam, Albert Beatty, Mac Garrity, Bill Fawcett, Karen Baker, Amy. We pray for those who are experiencing new events, for events for the Suncoast Emmaus weekends. May they find what they need in those. Each of us brings our own concerns this morning and throughout the week. Help us to be those who feed the hungry and shelter the naked. Let the love of God shine through Palmetto Presbyterian Church. All this and more we pray in the name of him who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I just, I can't move that cross. Something in me resists that. The creator of the universe took on flesh, lives in the spirit, and is offered to you and me in bread and wine. Let us feast at this, the Lord's table. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray. It is indeed right and a confounding joy that you have created our beautiful world and that you envelop us in your power and love. We are united in you. Help us to remember that we are in your flow, your kingdom and that all will be well. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with all the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your name, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth celebrate you. Blessed is Jesus, born of Mary, our brother and savior, the manifestation of God being with us. In love, in suffering, you showed us that being in relationship with you was our greatest delight. Let us open our hearts to feel your life pulsing in us. On the night when he died, our Lord took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this remembering me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant shed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do so remembering me. So as we eat this bread and drink this cup, let us remember that through Christ, our sins are forgiven and we are freed to live a life of service and love. Holy Spirit, come, be the wild bird who gives us courage and hope. Strengthen in us the desire to show you forth in all our life. Let me say that the Lord's Supper is not ours, it is God's. And therefore we welcome everybody to celebrate and share in the Lord's Supper. All is now ready, please distribute the elements.
the body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for you. The cup of salvation shed for you. We don't often underestimate the number of people who are here, but uh, delighted to have that problem. blood of Christ shed for you. Through Christ, in Christ, and with Christ, 
All honor and glory are yours, almighty God. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Let Us Break Bread Together. Robin, if you want to give us a few words about uh, your ancestor. This... So it's not Let Us Break Bread Together. Thank you. Our closing hymn is number 460. Let us break bread together. Be seated. each other using the words of the benediction found in your bulletin. We go nowhere by accident. Wherever we go, God is sending us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. God has a purpose in our being there. Christ who dwells within us has something he wants to do through us where we are. Believe this and go in the joy of God's power and love and grace.
Let me note that there's